Germans in general were very, very quick to start accepting the idea of Bitcoin and understanding it because they had such a history of their own hyperinflation in the 1930s when their fiat currency lost so much of its value. Similarly in Russia, I think um, in countries where we haven't in recent memory had incidents of um, hyperinflation, then people tend to just trust the government's backed currency without really really thinking about it, um, thinking that it is very, very safe. Whereas, in fact, experience over history in various other countries tells us that they are not inherently safe just because they're backed by a government. Your crypto working for you? It can be with yield farming. But what are the risks? Hacking, volatility, poor smart contracts, scams. Even if you overcome the risks, there are still limitations. Do you have a million dollars to invest? Yield farming is a very complex, time-consuming, and expensive process. Can you imagine that not only you need to possess advanced skills to mitigate your risk and check smart contracts, but also you need to quit your job? In order to get the highest return, you need to manage thousands of platforms and check protocols around the clock. Well, not anymore. We are proud to announce the SwissBorg Smart Yield account. It's now possible for anyone to earn yield on most of your cryptos, such as USDC, Bitcoin, Ether, BNB, and only starting with 10 euros, the tap of your finger. So how does it work? It's simple. On a daily basis, Oracle scans and monitors all the different investment opportunities and delivers for you the best investment returns. So how is that more secure? Not only do we assess the best risk reward ratio, but also your assets are protected for our MPC technology and our safety net program. And how it does deliver return? Well, because our system is scanning the market every single day, you get the optimal return on that day. How do you get started? It's easy in three different steps. The first one, you deposit. The second one, you start the yield program. And the third one, you start relaxing, enjoying your passive income. So guys, you know what to do. Subscribe to the Smart Yields, buckle up, and enjoy the ride. Dear crypto community blockchain buddies across the globe, welcome back to Kryptonites, the no BS blockchain channel built with the community and for the community. And today we have another mind-blowing guest, Rian Lewis, the author of Cryptocurrency Revolution, a blockchain dev, a Bitcoin OG here in the UK. And we're going to talk about some really exciting stuff, centuries with regards to the evolution of money all the way to Bitcoin and beyond. And before we kick off, a big shout out to Crypto Slate for always making summarized version of these articles we love you guys. Appreciate all the support. And now, Rian, thank you so much for coming on the show. I've heard so many good things about you from some of the earliest guys in the space in London. How are you doing today? I'm good, thank you. Really excited to be here. Thanks so much for asking me on the show. Thank you so much for coming on the show. It's a real pleasure. And I'd love to kick off this interview by saying that the Cryptocurrency Revolution book is an absolute masterpiece, guys. The flow, the structure, the information, the research, everything is really, really good. And we're gonna to try to give you some highlights of this book today. So thank you so much for taking the time in writing such a great book. Thank you. I'm just really stoked that you enjoyed it. It is really, really good. And I'd love to start off with the very first chapter in the book, which you kick off as what is money. And it's fascinating because we're talking about the evolution of money. And if, Rian, if we can imagine ourselves jumping into the DeLorean in Back to the Future with, you know, Marty, Doc, Einstein, the dog in the back, and we go all the way back to the early days of money. Can you bring us back there and tell us, you know, how things were back then? 
Well, for me, this is one of the most interesting things about um, not just cryptocurrency, but human society and humans in general, is this idea that um, we have to exchange value with each other in order to um, have society, in order to, um, you know, have anything approaching the life we have now. And going right back, of course, there was no money. If you were somebody who grew... Um, crops you could only exchange them with other people who grew crops and it just limited society to tiny little villages and then eventually once people started exchanging um tokens the earliest types of tokens were actually tools um so you might have somebody who swapped a very early kind of shovel or digging fork with somebody in exchange for crops and gradually this is a, such a fascinating story in very very early china um instead of swapping like a, a shovel or a fork with somebody, they started shrinking them so that they would give somebody a representation of a shovel or a fork. And those were the first tokens because it wasn't a barter, it was something that represented something else. And of course, over following centuries, people used all kinds of things that were scarce and which had value through scarcity, like seashells, or stones or beads or jewellery and of course that morphed into um, people exchanging gold or silver which then very gradually the idea of standardization came in because you might have a block of gold but of course you couldn't exchange it for something small and people had to trust that the gold was pure so then you had the idea of coins coming in and then paper money and very very gradually we evolved to this um, system that we have now but it's my belief that if people thought more about what money actually is which basically money is just a way of transporting value through time and space and with um, Bitcoin in particular came this idea of a purely native um, form of money that was suitable for the digital age. Whereas before, we've been trying to adapt traditional forms of money to the digital age so that um, the idea of using traditional forms of money, you know, via bank accounts and bank cards um, in a um, connected Web3 world is as stupid as trying to drag around stones and lumps of gold in a web two world so um, the evolution of money through centuries is just something that really fascinates me that's amazing so you just put out centuries literally in a few minutes which is incredible but was it as you were saying because in the beginning we had crops versus crops you were saying and then tools people exchanging tools was it the convenience and the perceived value that made people want to move on from shell money to the stones of yap to gold, what, what were the factors that made people realize, okay, we need to transition into a better form of money? Well, it's very limiting if you think about it. Um, if you can only exchange a crop for one type of crop, there's no way of storing that value. So you might have a field of corn that you um, harvest once a year, but what do you do with that? You can't store corn for a whole year and barter it for the whole year. You need a way of storing the value that you make through your labor and then accessing it later and being able to exchange it for things. So then the idea of these more durable substances like stone or clay tools or gold or whatever came about. But um, in conjunction with durability like that, you also need scarcity because if, for example, you don't really find shell money in the sense of very, very common shells that you can just go and pick up from the beach. Or I don't know if you remember in my book, the story about the dog who picked up a leaf. Um, and I, I just thought this was such an amazing story. Um, the dog that lived on a university campus in Colombia, and he saw students walking into the cafeteria with dollar bills to pay for their coffee. So he started picking up leaves off the ground and walking in <laughs> and <laughs> exchanging a leaf for doggy snacks. And I just thought that was the coolest story ever because 
even this dog could understand the idea, the symbolic value of going and exchanging money um, to receive goods in return. Only the thing the dog got wrong is you couldn't use leaf because there's no scarcity in leaves. And again, that brings us full circle back to Bitcoin and how we are able to represent digital scarcity for the first time in history. And that's why Bitcoin was just such a quantum leap. Amazing. And you also mentioned, and Clarice was telling me this earlier very beautifully and elegantly, you said in the book that that money does not to, does not need to to be or to have a legal tender. Do you mind like a little bit elaborating on that? Because that's a very interesting quote from the book. Yeah, this is one thing that people are really confused by. Basically, money is anything that some other party, some other person or organization will ex accept in exchange for something that they could be offering you. So, for example, we go back not quite as far as centuries, but almost a century ago to the Second World War. And people would exchange, um, like soldiers would exchange cigarettes for goods, for example. So a cigarette, because it's um, a fairly standardized unit of currency, and most people smoked in those days. Cigarettes were being used as money. Um, in fairly recent history in Britain, you could go into shops and receive stamps, postage stamps as change. Um, and this idea of something um, that anyone is prepared to accept is effectively money, whereas people get very confused in their minds and they think that money is something that the government have specified that you're allowed to use to pay people, whereas in fact you can pay people with anything you want. That's a really good point because as you said, you know, back in the days it wasn't a legal tender and still as of today people are willing to exchange value without necessarily using banknotes, right? Exactly. And I think that was the big um, thing that took people by surprise when um, way back the first um, purchases were made with Bitcoin. It was like people were like, but you can't do that. It's not legal tender. And of course it is. I mean, in the early days when people used to um, buy coffees and beer with Bitcoin, um, you know, when transaction fees were a fraction of a cent and obviously the value of Bitcoin um, in fiat terms was much less than it was now and people would go into a coffee shop. And it was, it was really quite threatening to people, I think, this idea that you could go in and pay with something that wasn't, you know, a British pound or a dollar or whatever. Um, it just opened the door wide to not just um, a new technology, but an entirely different way of thinking. Um, but the weird thing is that this isn't even something that came about with Bitcoin. Private currencies were actually surprisingly common maybe 150 years ago. It's just that governments legislated to encourage people to only use government approved money. But in fact, there's no reason why you can't use anything you want as payment. Imagine like you're at a dinner table and you have one of those friends of yours who's quite skeptical and loves to debate you. What is the most common concern or objection that you have from your friends or family or people who know that you're in this Bitcoin craze, you know, as they they call it? Is it the fact that it's not backed by a government? Is that the most common concern or are there any other ways that they try to challenge you when knowing that you're a pro Bitcoin? It's fascinating because the um, the way the debates framed has changed over um, over the years, and I think people are much less skeptical than they used to be. I think the um, there are two main areas of concern. People genuinely don't understand the idea of digital scarcity, um, and they perceive Bitcoin as having no value because it's a purely digital asset and it's not backed by something. But then the same people are often really amazed when you point out that, in fact, um, fiat currencies are not backed by anything. I think uh, there's this misconception. I saw a survey recently where I think 43% of Americans still believed that the dollar was backed by gold. And this is actually an amazing statistic to me, but then I think people don't think a lot about money. Um, although interestingly, you find 
a lot less Bitcoin scepticism in countries where there has been a history of inflation, um, hyperinflation or devaluation of the country's own currency. So um, I spent quite a lot of time living in Germany. Um, Germans in general were very, very quick to start accepting the idea of Bitcoin and understanding it because they had um, such a history of their own hyperinflation in the 1930s when their fiat currency lost so much of its value. Similarly in Russia, I think um, in countries where we haven't in recent memory had incidents of um, hyperinflation, then people tend to just trust the um, the government's backed currency without really thinking about it, um, thinking that it is very, very safe. Whereas, in fact, experience over history in various other countries tells us that they are not inherently safe just because they're backed by a government. So that's one area of concern that people express. The other one, of course, is, oh, it's all anonymous and it's used for crime. Um, well, the answer I normally give to that is that there is far more criminal activity and money laundering conducted through fiat currencies than there is through Bitcoin. You can use anything for any purpose that you want. And of course, we know that in fact, if you want to hide criminal activity, Bitcoin is probably the worst idea there is because there is a re immutable record of your transactions on the blockchain. So, um, and of course it's pseudonymous rather than anonymous. Lots of people are quite surprised when you point that out. So true, so true. And that's the same objection that I get, by the way, Rian. It's like, basically I tell people, you know, do you know that this is not backed by a dollar anymore when I show them a hundred dollar bill or a hundred pound bill and I say that it actually costs between 30 to 40 cents or pence to print this bill you know with when you talk about the paper when you talk about the ink when you talk about the cover the layer that covers the bill it's roughly 30 to 40 cents and when I usually tell them that then all of a sudden they're like oh Okay, <laughs> so it's kind of a, a little bit of a breakthrough, but uh, that makes a lot of sense. I feel exactly what you're saying about this. So fast forward fiat currencies and gold. Let's go all the way to January 2009, uh, the creation of Bitcoin. What was it exactly that made you fall in love with this space particularly? I know, Rianne, that you're a super cool woman. You're actually a smart co contract developer as well. But was there any particular part that really resonated with you to get into this space and to write your book and do all this cool stuff? Um, well, you have to go way back to when I was at university um, in the 1980s at UCL in London. And um, I did a BSc in economics. I've always been really interested by financial systems. And at the exact time I was doing my degree, um, David Chome published a paper on eCash. And I've always been really interested in science fiction. And um, this idea of having digital cash for a world that you could see even back in the 80s or 90s would happen at some point that seemed incredibly sci-fi then but which now is reality is something that had always fascinated me so this idea of digital cash was something that I was really really obsessed by and um, by early adopter standards I guess it's not particularly early i read about Bitcoin. It was sort of on my radar in 2012, but it wasn't until 2013 that I really, really started digging into it and getting immersed in the community. And weirdly, to it might seem really crazy to people now, I thought I'd missed the boat with the Bitcoin price wow. <laughs> in 2013 um, in terms of trading. So um, it was about the time that the first wave of altcoins were coming. So in 2013, I started trading altcoins just a tiny little bit, just dabbling, just because I was really fascinated by the idea that the first crypto exchanges were um, were happening. And that was, I suppose that was the beginning of my descent down the rabbit hole. Um, I found that because it was back in the days when um, 
stuff wasn't managed for you like it is now. You had to have your own wallets um, and the exchange, even every, everything was far less slick. You didn't have like Binance with its beautiful user interface that is very easy for people to use and everything. Didn't have that in those days. It was a whole load of crypto exchanges more or less run by enthusiasts. And I had money, I had uh, different alts on different exchanges, different wallets, couldn't keep track of it. So a friend and I decided that we were going to um, write our own altcoin portfolio tracker, um, which is still running, actually. It's where we're working on a V2 of it, but it just kind of runs itself. Countmycrypto.com released that in early 2014. And the whole world was just a really exciting world. And one of the things that makes it really special and interesting is the people so say over the years I just met some really amazing people through the whole crypto community and yeah it's been a never-ending journey since then amazing so quick question so as you said eCash 1983 was kind of the first form of anonymous cryptographic electronic money what made Bitcoin become so much more successful than eCash. What was the USP or kind of the core trade or property that you've found made Bitcoin such a phenomenon? It's this idea of solving the double spend problem. I mean, I, I'm sure that, you know, I'm sp speaking to a very, very educated audience here who are going to be familiar with these principles. But first of all, um, the eCash was way ahead of its time in the sense that you have to remember that we didn't have an internet in those days with um, that normal people used. You know, we had the beginnings of the internet, but it was kind of used by academics and researchers and um, primarily at universities. Um, but solving the double spend problem is, it's the core of Bitcoin. Understand that and you understand everything. This idea that um, if I send you an email saying I'm, sen I, I'm sending you a dollar, you can send that to somebody else and you have no proof that the original dollar still exists. Whereas with Bitcoin, you can make the payment, a payment digitally that can only occur once because you have um, obviously a distributed network where everybody can see the same source of truth. It's just such a beautifully elegant and powerful idea that everybody can see the same ledger. You can only spend one Bitcoin or one fraction of a Bitcoin once it's transparent and you've got this unbreakable history. Just the idea of it is um, is amazing. Very nicely put, very nicely put. And thank you for explaining the double spend problem because we talk about it a lot, but you just explained it in, in such layman terms, so easy to understand. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so that's really cool. So we went from eCash, we fast forwarded to 2009, the creation of Bitcoin, January 2009. Now, if we can fast forward a little bit to 2013 and the first altcoins, can you talk a little bit about the evolution from 2009 to 2013? That would be great. Yeah, so um, to th that period was absolutely fascinating because, of course, we see during that time the emergence of um, people spending Bitcoin on something other than just sending it backwards and forwards to each other. We see um, the first bricks and mortar purchase used um, with Bitcoin, um, which was actually at a bar that um, I have been to many times in Berlin, room 77. The first time somebody actually walked into somewhere in real life and conducted a Bitcoin transaction, because even the Bitcoin pizzas, although they were for real goods and services, um, it wasn't so somebody actually walking in somewhere and paying for something. But the um, development of um, different altcoins, I mean, things like, for example, we, when we were chatting um, before the show, you mentioned Litecoin. It's difficult because you still have this um, real debate with, um, obviously, the Bitcoin maxis. And while I have a lot of sympathy and um, agreement with their position that there is only one Bitcoin. I do think that other um, altcoins do have 
more to offer perhaps than um, the maxis will allow. And it was interesting because um, things like Litecoin and Dogecoin were much easier, for example, for people to mine. I bought, um, I bought myself a little um, grid seed miner back in um, 2014 and it meant, um, you know, the algorithm meant that it was much easier to, using script meant that it was much easier to mine things like Dogecoin or altcoin and or Dogecoin or Litecoin and everybody could have a go at it. Um, and then of course we see the evolution of um, things like Counterparty which was um, described rather poetically as writing in the margins of Bitcoin transactions which I absolutely love. Kind of a precursor to the um, idea of um, registering assets on different blockchains. You could have what were called then colored coins. Um, and then, of course, we see the evolution of Ethereum, which was such a huge story, it kind of overtook everything else. And um, the development of Ethereum, for all Ethereum's faults, it's just been a really interesting philosophical journey that I continue to follow with great interest. And if I can pause you right there, because that is, you're going into a very interesting uh, chapter of, of our whole evolution. But just going back, so just to rehearse what you were saying, you said something about the Bitcoin maxis, which is very, very interesting. And, you know, I have a few friend maxis. I had two invades on the show and stuff like that. Um, and they have one good point, which I do like. By the way, I'm not at all a maxi. I, I love the token economics. And I do believe that Bitcoin is a monetary revolution. But I believe that smart contracts are the real financial revolution. But we can we can talk about this together. But uh, one question I'd love to ask you, Ryan, is the Bitcoin maxis tend to say that there will never be another Bitcoin. It will never be replaced. And there are best argument, which I find behind this, is the fact that Bitcoin was built by a grassroots movement of privacy activists, of libertarians, and there was no CEO, there was no intent of getting rich or making money and all these kind of things. Is that the best argument for Bitcoin? Or do you do you think Bitcoin can be replaced one day? Or is it it has too too much in terms of its philosophy and the, the grassroots movement behind it? This is where I absolutely 100% agree with the Maxis. I do not think Bitcoin will ever be replaced. Um, and I think any attempts to build things which are another Bitcoin will fail because um, exactly as you say, I think this idea of um, being built by a um, grassroots community and the effect the fact that we don't know who Satoshi Nakamoto is, is such a huge thing. Because if you take, for example, what happened with um, Ethereum, with the flash crash that happened when there was a rumor that um, Vitalik Buterin was dead. I mean, thank God he wasn't, but someone um, put a rumor out on Reddit that um, there'd been a car crash and um, he had unfortunately passed away. And uh, fortunately, Fortunately, that turns out not to be true, but then it did underline um, the real dependency that when um, a, when a, a token or a network is so dependent on the presence of or the opinion of one person, it becomes very difficult to divorce that person from the activities of the network and see that it's decentralized in the proper sense. Only I do think Bitcoin is properly decentralized because of this. And in fact, there was this amazing post. I should send it to you after we've chatted, actually. I don't know if you read Lynn Alden, but she is absolutely amazing. She is an analyst who has her own um, a blog and paid service. But she wrote this amazing story about network effects and Bitcoin and um, going back through different um different companies operating in the web 2 space before bitcoin and describing why they were incredibly difficult for people to come along and compete with and saying that bitcoin has exactly the same network effect it was a really interesting blog post but yeah in answer to your question no there will never be another bitcoin that makes a lot of sense because you know when steve jobs passed away the apple stock took a hit 
And I'm pretty sure if, if Elon Musk passes, Tesla will, would take a hit as well, right? In terms of the value and, and the perception that the, the people have. Yeah, absolutely. Are, are you kind of hit by this, uh, the current NFT kind of craze we're having about having art and, and collectibles and, you know, cars and all these things? Is that uh, just a hype at the moment or do you really see a full blown potential as well in the NFT space? I think it's amazing. I'm fascinated by it. Um, I wrote a really, really long article on Hacker Noon last year about um, NFTs in virtual reality. I think that's probably something where um, the real growth is going to be. I mean, the pandemic in general, with everybody confined to their houses, has meant that a lot of um, the, the, there's been an explosion of interest in VR. And the idea of representing goods in games and virtual worlds with NFTs is one that's absolutely not going to go away. That's where I see a lot of growth. I must admit, I'm not a huge dabbler in NFTs, although um, a friend of mine put me on to um, the Wax Network, which is kind of like a um, EOS offshoot. And I've been um, just dabbling a little bit on Atomic Hub. There's some fun stuff on there, but literally it's for pennies as compared to the sort of tens of thousands or millions that other NFTs are going for. I think there's a lot of hype at the moment. Um, there's a lot of uh, silly money being paid for things that really aren't worth it. But over time, I think that'll shake out. It's a bit like the ICOs in 2017. That has to happen. It's a necessary process that we have to go through for, um, for the sector to really establish itself. So all the headlines are around people paying millions or hundreds of thousands for i don't know crypto punks or whatever or like, a fake banksy painting <laughs> exactly i mean it is crazy money i think it's no bad thing because it sparks a debate and it gets people talking about it um i think it's really going to be important for the passion economy for the creator economy going forward um, because it enables people to take control of um, the way they market and sell things um, directly. I think it's going to be an absolutely massive thing and maybe it needs this kind of slightly bubbly thing at the moment in order for everything to shake out. But I think the technology itself isn't going anywhere and we're all going to be in VR buying NFTs in a couple of years' time, and it'll just seem really normal. Rian, would it be fair to say that Bitcoin is the monetary revolution, we have the financial revolution, and with the arrival of NFTs and all these unique types of goods, it's a, just a digital revolution? Is that what it will be called? Or what, what, is, what is the next phase? Because we stop at financial revolution in your book, but what is the next phase? Is it just digital revolution? Is it global revolution, economic revolution? What do you think it will be? I think it's a combination of all of these, but it is just the next evolution in the development of humanity, really. Um, it's very difficult to separate all these things from what people... Well, if you think about all technology, it only exists because of people, right? Um, every piece of software that is written is written to benefit a person somewhere down the line. Even if it's software that allows one machine to talk to another machine, at the end of the day, it's for the benefit of a human somewhere. Um, and this move towards a purely digital native economy is something that we can just see as our next step as humanity. Amazing. Wow. This is so cool. We went centuries back. We went all the way to the creation of eCash and then Bitcoin and then Litecoin and then Dogecoin and the Ethereum Foundation from 2013 to 2015. Uh, NFTs, which is one of the hottest topics as of today. I'd love to ask you one more question because you did some smart contracts and you, you, you actually developed on the Ethereum blockchain. What is the next topic other than NFTs for the future? Since we've been talking a lot about the past and the present, um, do you see ETH 2.0 going well? A lot of the developers are actually concerned about the transition from proof of work to proof of stake. Uh, and what are the, the next topics? You know, some people say it's proof of stake chains. It's what is it for you? 
Wow, such a <laughs> such a difficult question. Yeah. <laughs> um, as far as smart contracts go, I'm a dabbler rather than um, <laughs> rather than an expert. Um, but yeah, it's I think it, it's one of the big unanswered questions. I think um, proof of work is incredibly important. And again, going back to the Bitcoin maxis, that's where I agree with them. I think proof of stake. There are lots of problems with um, the fundamentals of how it's governed. You can get around it. There are various different philosophical and governance approaches to it. I really like the idea of proof of work because it's, I don't know, like having electricity or something. It's stored work, stored potential. Um, I would actually see the main um, developments happening as coming with layer two, um, with side chains, with um, very with state chains, with with. I would prefer something that is a proof of work network, but with other things pegged or tied into it or developed around it. There's something about proof of stake, which makes me think that while yes, it's interesting and it's valid, it's almost like it feels second best to me. And I know there are people who say, but wow, it's so much better than the idea of proof of work. Something in in it just makes me feel a little hesitant about it. But on the other hand, it's kind of all an improvement over what we have now in terms of centralized technologies. So to my mind, anything that tends towards the arc of decentralization is an improvement on what we have now, whether that's proof of work, proof of stake, whatever. Um, the I think the key thing is that whatever solution we have, it's one that scales properly while um, not trading off too much in terms of security. Um, a lot of people make the mistake in talking about Bitcoin, for example, as highlighting the absolute rate of transactions per second and comparing that with other payment systems. Whereas it's more like a settlement layer that other things can happen on top of. Not everything has to happen on chain all the time. Um, I think all these different projects that are doing interesting things like Polkadot, for example, with um, different uh, and projects that have federated chains and bridges and so on. There's just all this cool technology that's happening that will mean that things scale. Um, but there's a lot of work that needs to go into it. And I think people underestimate the amount of work quite often unpaid that people are doing at the core level of these protocols. Very nicely put. All right. This was such a fascinating interview, guys. Rian Lewis, author of The Cryptocurrency Revolution, a very nice book. We'll put all your information for people to follow you as well, Rian. And before we leave, do you have one last meaningful message that you'd love to share with the community? Oh, wow. <laughs> I love these. I love these meaningful messages. Um, just that trust Bitcoin, I suppose. <laughs> there you go. Trust Bitcoin. There you go. And I think that's a, a great message. And and really, you've you've been a, an amazing guest. You know, all the, all the people here in London know you very well. Hopefully, people from all over the world will get to follow you and hear more about your thoughts. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Guys, don't forget to follow us every Wednesday, premiering at a PC near you, 8 o'clock GMT. Thank you so much for watching and see you next week, guys.